Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Branches of Wisdom, the Banyan Books podcast. I'm your host, Ross Makichi, and I'm very excited about our honored guest today, Jetsunma Tenzin Palmo. Before we begin uh, our conversation, Banyan Books would like to acknowledge that although we have people joining us from all over the world for these live streaming events, the physical location of Banyan Books and Sound is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Most of Banyan's events and podcasts are free, we welcome your donations to keep these programs accessible for all. Just go ahead and click on the PayPal link in the show description below. So this evening is the second time we've had the privilege of hosting Jetsunma Tenzin Palmo on Branches of Wisdom. About today's guest, Lama Sultram Alione, who we've also had on this podcast, said the following. Palmo's is a voice we need to hear a woman who has fully experienced what she speaks about with an absolute honesty, delightful humor, and real insight. In February 2008, Tenzin Palma was given the rare title of Jetsunma, which means Venerable Master, by His Holy Holiness the 12th Gyalwang Drukpa, head of the Drukpa Kagyu lineage, in recognition of her spiritual achievements as a nun and her efforts in promoting the status of female practitioners in Tibetan Buddhism. She is a bhikshuni in that same Drukpa lineage and is founder of the Dongyu Gatsal Ling Nunnery in Himachal Pradesh, India. Jetsunma is best known for being one of the very few Western yoginis trained in the East, having spent 12 years living in a remote cave in the Himalayas, three of those years in strict meditation retreat. In addition to her role as founding director of DGL Nunnery, Jetsunma plays many leadership roles, including being president of Sakya Ditta International Association of Buddhist Women. She's the author of a number of books, including Into the Heart of Life and The Heroic Heart, which we spoke with her about last time she was with us on Branches of, of Wisdom about one year ago. Today, Jetsunma Tenzin Palmo is with Banyan Books in conversation about her book, Reflections on a Mountain Lake teachings on practical Buddhism. Taken from a series of talks that she gave in the U.S. and Australia in 96 and 97, this broad-ranging collection of Dharma teachings addresses topics of common concern to Buddhist practitioners from all traditions, and the book was re-released this year with a brand new cover. To find out more about Jetsunma Tenzin Palmo's life and work, please visit her website at www tenzinpalmo.com. Banyan Books community, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jetsunma Tenzin Palmo. Thank you, Ross. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too. Thanks so much for being here. Now, when we spoke about a year ago uh, about your book, The Heroic Heart, you and Felipe were in La Huo starting to work on a follow-up documentary uh, to Cave in the Snow. 
You were also talking about all the good things happening at DGL Nunnery and the wonderful work of all the people there. So I was just wondering if we could maybe get a little update. What has been happening in the past year? Is the documentary progressing? How are the nuns and everyone doing at DGL? <laughs> um the the documentary is quietly slowly progressing and uh philippe now is trying to get more time to uh dedicate to completing that now um actually this year has been quite full uh for my 80th birthday i went with a friend to on pilgrimage to japan for the first time to uh koyasan nara and kyoto then we went to this wonderful women's conference, Buddhist women's conference called Sakidita. I'm no longer, by the way, uh, president of Sakidita, so we have to cut that out. Okay. Um, <laughs> now uh, Sharon Sue is, is the president, but it was a wonderful um, event uh, set up in Korea by the Korean nuns, 3,000 participants from all the Buddhist world, Thailand, Burma, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Korea, Taiwan, and so forth, as well as Westerners. A wonderfully joyous atmosphere. Of course, men are also very welcome, and Philippe went. Um, but uh, it's basically a women's conference uh, organized by women. And then from there, we went back to uh, Philippe and I, and two friends went back to Lahul to do a retreat for one month in a small monastery there, a small nunnery. The nuns there took wonderful good care of us. Lahul is a very, very special place. It's land of the Dakinis. So um, it's a very enhancing atmosphere to practice in. The nuns are fine. Uh, they also did their annual two month retreat uh, in July and August, and now they're back to their study program. And uh, yeah, we're fine. Well, that's great to hear. It sounds like a very nice year so far. Uh, it brings me, you, you mentioned this women's conference. In the first chapter of Reflections on a Mountain Lake, you mentioned wanting to reintroduce. Now, this was before, I believe, DGL Nunnery actually began. You mentioned wanting to reintroduce a special yogic tradition meant just for female practitioners who were known as, I don't know if I'm going to say this word right, Togdenma. That's right. And you said also we, there were only... We have, now, we have now a retreat center here with uh, 14, 15 nuns in it, and many of them have already completed nearly 15 years of retreat. And they are being taught uh, by the Tokden uh, from our nearby monastery of Kampaga Tashijong. So that, um, that aspiration has in fact been fulfilled. That's wonderful because you indicated there was only two lamas still living that could pass on that transmission. Yes, well, come to Rinpoche, who is our, our root guru. He went to Tibet specifically to receive the transmission on the, on these yogic teachings from someone called Adar Rinpoche, who was the last great master of that tradition in Tibet. And uh, so then he passed on the transmission to our nuns and the actual teaching on how to practice uh, was originally given by the last Tokten to have come out of Tibet, uh, Tokten Archer. So he, he himself, although he was in his eighties, um, taught them personally, and now they're being taught by other um, younger Tokten. So they have been, uh, well cherished. It took a bit of time for the the lamas to get it together to actually hand on this very um, sacred but male transmission to uh, the nuns. But finally, they agreed that they would do so. And having agreed to do so, they have done it with um, very meticulously. They have been very, very careful to hand on the tradition very very carefully so we are very very grateful for that is there anything you're able to share with us about that tradition that for us to understand a little bit about it or is it something that's more private no basically it's um based on what are called the the six doctrines or the six yogas of narupa 
in Tibetan and Narachudruk. And um, the, uh, the other side of it, the Mahamudra tradition. And uh, so, uh, and other uh, deity to do, uh, practices which they have to do at the same time. So there's a special um, transmission for these uh, six doctrines within the, the Drukpa Kaju Kampaka lineage. And that was what we needed this very specific lineage which they hold and which now they, they've passed on. It's to do with um, inner yogas and especially Tumo, the inner heat um, tradition. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the things that really uh, pulled my attention in, in the book, which is taken from your talks in Reflections on a Mountain Lake, was about Vajrayana practice and the deity visualizations. Um, at the start of the last chapter, which which is titled Visualizing the Deity, you talk about creative imagination and why visualization techniques are crucial in Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, and in regards to the power of creative imagination, you say, quote unquote, it is in itself a very powerful tool because the mind has many levels and only the surface levels can be reached through verbal logic. The deeper and more primitive levels respond to images rather than words. Um, I'm often uh, run into difficulty trying to explain why the intellectual approach can only take us so far in our, in our development. I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit on this point for us. Well, I mean, obviously our, our intellectual levels are, we talk to ourselves, we lose language. And um, that can be very subtle, but it's still very dualistic. And it's still really just the surface of the mind. I mean, if we consider the mind like an ocean, then our intellect and our language skills belong to the surface of the ocean, the waves and the undercurrents. And the deeper levels of the ocean, uh, where, which is the majority of the ocean, actually. But normally we don't see it because we're riding on top on the waves and being tossed up and down by the, you know, the various currents. And we are so occupied with that, that we don't do deep sea diving. And so therefore we are almost unconscious of the unconscious, so to say. And uh, therefore visualization and creative skills are one way of beginning to go deeper into the various more subtle levels of our consciousness, which are not available through purely verbal uh, access. We, it's a much deeper level of creativity and can even go beyond the ego. The ego is very um, connected with our intellectual process. So that's why it's, and I mean, I don't know if I made the point in the book, but the, these visualizations are not just arbitrary. They, they came from the enlightened mind of great masters. And so it's a, a route back down into re, um, reaffirming the original insights of these great masters by visualizing the same kind of visualizations that they themselves created. I mean, somewhere I say, it's like, you know, if, if you visualize, why visualize Tara or Avalokiteshvara? You know, why not visualize something Western, you know, Mickey Mouse and, and, you know, and so forth. But then if you visualize Mickey Mouse, you maybe access the consciousness of Walt Disney. And is this really what we need? You know, I mean, we want to get back to the visualization, the, the mind of Naropa, for example, you know, and for that, we need to track back the uh, process which he himself created to come back to that deeper level 
of our consciousness. So that's why, I mean, even great lamas who, and practitioners who, you know, are completely at ease within the nature of the mind, they still do all these very complicated practices because they see the benefit. Otherwise, they wouldn't bother. Why, why, why do they bother to go through all these visualizations if you can just rest in the nature of the mind? But they rest in the nature of the mind and they do all these visualizations. So there must be some deeper benefit which they, do, in fact, have understood. And some um, people love visualizing. So it's not, it's not um, you know, something which is, is painful. It's something which gives great joy. That, that enjoyment of the practice is something that you touch in early in the book, in, in chapter one. Uh, and in the Q&A portion, one of the students uh, from the talk that you were at asked you about your time in retreat in the cave. And they specifically asked you about a health condition that many practitioners develop in retreat called, I don't know if it's lung or lung. Lung. Uh, lung. lung. Uh, you go on to talk about the need to not push ourselves too hard and to relax and enjoy the practice. Can you expand on that one a little more for us? Yes. Well, I mean, you know, the, one of the problems when people do um, go into retreat is that they want to attain something. And um, so therefore the, the feeling is that the more you do and, and the harder you try, the further you'll get. It's a bit like, you know, sort of training for the Olympics. Um, uh, but it's often very counterproductive because in the beginning it might seem to succeed because you're, you know, straight jacketing your, your mind and keeping it, you know, very strict and concentrated. And for a time, the mind acquiesces and becomes concentrated. But if we push too hard, suddenly, many people find it just sort of suddenly explodes and uh, goes quite crazy because it's, it's been too repressed. And then we develop uh, this condition of chronic imbalance called lung, uh, which can be both physical, people can feel quite physically wrecked, um, and it also can be uh, mental. Uh, either the mind goes really crazy or else it becomes completely exhausted or you get very bad headaches or all sorts of different, different people manifest in different ways. But definitely it's because of this chronic imbalance because of pushing too hard so therefore it's much more sensible to pace oneself right and with an inner inner feeling of open spacious relaxation as well as being centered and aware then that's very healthy and the mind stays healthy and the body likewise becomes uh, feeling very light and, and uh, at ease with itself. So part of this is joy. If we enjoy doing something, if we feel enthusiastic about doing something, then it even outwardly it might look difficult, but inwardly it, it seems easy because we love doing it. And like with any, any activity, if we enjoy it, then it comes easily for us, even if we make an effort. And so this is very important in, in the spiritual life. The Buddha himself said, this is a path of joy. He said, if it was a path of suffering, it would still be worth it for the result. But it's not a path of suffering. It's a path of joy. So therefore, how much more should people be willing to undertake it? So relaxed, open, spacious, aware, and with a great sense of delight in being able to uh, undertake the practice, then, then that's, that stays on track. Well, that's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, one of the things I, I observe is that our, I, I normally I'd want to say our Western conditioning, but I think it's, um, most places in the world now that have been industrialized, the paradigm is so achievement oriented and we're conditioned to be pushing. 
So it's kind of like a, a paradigm shift in order to bring this quality that you're describing into our practice, isn't it? Yeah, because who wants to achieve? Who wants to be enlightened? The ego, right? But the ego can never be enlightened. I mean, the ego is ignorance. And so what it can happen is that the ego gets polished. So then it thinks it's something very special. And other people can even be drawn to it because there's a charisma with a very shiny ego. Hmm. But that's, that's anti-spiritual, really, because the whole point is to dissolve our ego into something so much vaster. And um, if it solidifies all the more, because we have, you know, accomplished all our practices and done this many millions of mantras and this long retreat and we're something really special now, then, you know, essentially it's going in completely the wrong direction. So this is why being very relaxed, being very open, recognizing that ultimately we already are what we want to become is uh, emphasized that, you know, along with our practices to recognize that ultimately we already are there. We just don't recognize our true nature. Then you can just let go. And you distinguish um, at the start of chapter 13, you, cut, you give the, a very succinct definition of uh, Hinayana, Mahayana, and Vajrayana uh, schools of Buddhism and their goals and, and how they relate to one another. And I believe it's Vajrayana, which you're talking about, where the philosophy is that our Buddha nature is already present. Everything already is that. And it's just purifying our view in order to realize that. Is that true? Yes. But of course, even in, in uh, the earlier schools, it's always recognized that although we are trying to attain nirvana, nirvana is within. I mean, it's not something outside that the world suddenly disappears when we, we attain nirvana. Nirvana is just a change in our perception. And it's when the dualistic egocentric mind begins to dissolve into something so much vaster and clearer. And we begin to see how things really are and not the way we perceive them with our distorted perceptions. So it's all still understood that it's within us. It's our innate potential that we have to recognize. It's not something new, which we, uh, you know, is something alien to us or something somebody gives us. It's just that we suddenly see how things really are instead of how we normally assume they are. I mean, this is where, um, you know, modern neuroscience becomes quite interesting in the way they also understand that what we perceive is not what's really out there. And that the ego is a fabrication from our brain center. Can you comment on the, the concept of, you, t you talked about polishing the ego what about the, the, I know like early stages or maybe it's not even early stages, but part of the preparation in Buddhist practice is, um, I don't know if healing is the right word, refining the ego, creating a healthy sense of self before we go beyond. Can you speak a little bit to that point? How do we actually work with the ego, create a healthy ego and also work at dissolving that ego simultaneously? I think that's a very good point. Thank you for making it because um, Buddhism often seems very ego bashing. <laughs> and so um, everybody's afraid even to think about their, their ego being even healthy. Um, they've got to get rid of it or deny it. But if we look at what the Buddha actually taught, uh, especially in the early sutras, he starts with um, shamatha practice, calm abiding practice, to make the mind quiet and clear and more aware, more conscious. 
And in other words, to tame the mind, our mad monkey mind, right? Tame the monkey. And um, at the same time, he taught the four immeasurable practices, the Brahma Viharas of uh, loving kindness and friendliness, compassion, rejoicing, and equanimity. And he said, you start with yourself. May I be well and happy. May I be free from suffering and so forth. And so then we have to ask, well, who are we asking? May I be well and happy. We're not sending that to our, our Buddha nature. Our Buddha nature already is love and compassion. It doesn't need us to wish it. <clears throat> so who are we wishing the well-being to? Well, obviously to the ego. So when we do shamatha, calm abiding, in order to be able to really accomplish that, the, the psychic factors have to be very well balanced. We have to have a healthy sense uh, of of a uh, psychological state has to be healthy in order to, to attain to shamatha. I mean, someone who is well, tending to be psychotic shouldn't practice meditation. It's, it's at least only for very short periods because it can make them worse. It needs to have a very well-balanced sense of, of mind and that will help that doing shamatha practice. It helps to get the mind well-balanced and healthy then on top of that, we give friendliness, we befriend ourselves, we make friends with ourselves and we make the, our sense of self feel strong and, and, and happy and confident. And then that psychic background is going to walk the path, that healthy, confident little ego is going to walk the path towards non-ego. That self will dissolve eventually into selflessness. If the self, our sense of self is injured and in pain, it won't really be able to walk the path. So first we have to make it strong and healthy, a healthy sense of self, which then will walk the path to deeper fulfillment. So that's very sensible, you know, because, uh, you know, if we are psychologically disturbed, First, we have to heal ourselves. And then, of course, with that loving kindness and compassion from ourselves, we give to those we love, those we feel indifferent towards, and those we have problems with, and then to the whole world. But first, we have to fill up our own cup, right? Then we can pour it out to, to really be of genuine benefit to others. Many social workers, they spend all their time giving out, giving out, giving out to others, and they forget to uh, refill their own cup. And then they, you know, get disheartened, burned out, uh, have psychological crises. But it's because they're not breathing in as well as breathing out. I'm so glad you brought that point up. And I, I've got a question as a follow-up. I just want to remind our live audience that uh, Jitsunma is going to tend to some of your questions. So please go ahead and uh, type those into the chat and I'll read some of them out to her uh, in a little bit here. Um, yeah, you're speaking about people, social workers, people in helping fields. I wanted to ask you about that because so many of the teachings, of course, are on selflessness, generosity, loving kindness, which is obviously applicable to everybody. But there are people like you described who are already conditioned or wired to give too much of themselves. So how would you approach some of those teachings when it comes to someone that's wired that way? Well, I would, as I say, I mean, a lot of people come to me with this problem really good-hearted people, tremendously compassionate in the helping fields, and they just feel completely numb at a certain point. You know, it's just too much, and they just feel they're depleted. So that's why the Buddha himself said, you know, you, we have to start by enriching ourselves, making friends with ourselves, filling ourselves up so that then 
we can give out to others without becoming depleted. I mean, that's the point, that um, it should be a give and take. As I say, we breathe in, we breathe out. I mean, it's like having, um, do I have to look at myself? Yeah, yeah, there's no way to. Okay. Um, that it, it's like, you know, if you have a smartphone or any kind of technological instrument, we have to re keep recharging it. You know, because if you're only using it and you're never recharging, it goes flat. And that's exactly what happens. People go flat because all the juice has finished and they, um, you know, they re need to recharge. And recharging is part of compassion. You know, we have compassion for ourselves and compassion for others and the two, you know, empower each other. It's not either or, it's both and. I'd like to jump a little bit if I can. Um, one of the things that jumped out at me um, in, in chapter 13 on Vajrayana, you're describing the practice of visualizing ourselves as the deity and use the example of Guru Padma Sambhava as our very own original wisdom nature. And you say at one point, quote unquote, this is the glow of our Buddha nature. It is like a rainbow. This visualization is not solid. Padmasambhava does not possess liver, guts, and a heart. He is made up of rainbow light. This idea of the rainbow light body, I've heard it often referred to that masters have realized their rainbow light body. And when they die, often there will be a rainbow in the sky. Can you just comment on this? Uh, is it is it a literal rainbow light body? Is it symbolic? How are we to understand the rainbow light body? Uh, well, a rainbow light body. I mean, it's it's fairly rare, but they still have them even today. Um, often in people that nobody recognized were even actually practitioners. Um, you know, old Nobu down the road there that nobody's ever noticed. And then when he gets old, he says, look, I'm going to lock my door. Don't disturb me for a week. And um, so then nobody leaves him. And then at a certain point, people see rainbows coming in the sky, coming up from that room. And when they open the door, all they see are clothes and hair and nails because... Um, you know, hair and nails uh, are dead, right? They're not like, you know, the rest of the flesh, which is still alive. Um, that's why we can cut our hair and our nails and it doesn't hurt us. And, and so they have dissolved their, their physical being um, into primal elements, which uh, manifest to us as rainbows. So it's literally a rainbow body, yes. But I mean, as I say, it, it's 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 not the most common way. The more the second class rainbow body. That's first class rainbow body. Second class rainbow body is uh, that the body shrinks. If the uh, this is mostly for lamas, they keep the body for some time while they're doing rituals, etc. After they've passed away, after they've died, and then uh, the body shrinks and becomes very small. Um, that's much more common if they leave the body long enough before cremating. And uh, then, of course, most common is that people go into a state of what's called tukdam, where the at the time of death, instead of the consciousness just leaving the body, the very, very subtle consciousness resides at the heart chakra, and so the body doesn't decay and doesn't go into rigor mortis, and doesn't smell, or it often becomes, uh, as the days go by, more beautiful and more youthful looking. Um, and so that can be for hours, days, sometimes for weeks. Um, the body just stays there. The, it's basically brain dead, but there, there is some warmth at the heart chakra. And uh, then at a certain point, usually there's a little drop of blood and some a clear liquid from the nostrils and the body collapses 
and then they cremate. And often then there are what are called ring cell. That's also very common, uh, which are like um, sharira in, in Sanskrit, relics, you know. And sometimes they're very beautiful they're under a microscope, like they look like conch shells or different colored jewels and so forth. That you can see, anybody can see. So, I mean, it's because of doing these, especially doing these various Vajrayana practices, it, it changes the structure of even the physical body. How does that relate then, like these different sort of levels of the rainbow light body or the time of death that you described, how does that relate to how that consciousness or that being will reincarnate or not reincarnate? Well, I mean, it means that they don't need to go through the bardo, the intermediary state between death and rebirth, and that they can choose where they want to go. I mean, normally when we die because we are not in control of our mind, uh, our consciousness goes wherever our karma is going to send it, and we don't have much say in the matter. But if we die consciously, then we can be reborn consciously. So either they can go to what's called uh, a, a Buddha Pure Land or they can choose their future parents where it would be most auspicious to be reborn and so forth. That's where you get this, this um, phenomenon in the Tibetan tradition of, uh, of incarnate lamas, tukus or yangtze, uh, like the Dalai Lama, most famous of, you know, um, the idea is that you choose your parents and sometimes they write before they die the name of their parents so that there's no, uh, you can't mistake it. And then they, they, they get reborn there. And in Tibet, of course, they were then discovered and taken back to the same old monastery again and go through the same old process, <laughs> lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. Nowadays, of course, you get more variety. They choose to get reborn in all sorts of interesting places, <laughs> not just <Tibet. laughs> We need them all over the world, don't we? Well, and they, I think they recognize that maybe that's exactly what they need to do, is to get reborn in different cultures, different settings, and take it from there. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to ask a question about mantra, if I can. Um, sp uh, speaking on connecting with a deity, this is in the book, Reflections on a Mountain Lake. Uh, speaking on connecting with a deity through meditation, visualization, and mantra, you said, quote unquote, if we say it with perfect concentration, really focusing on the visualization and becoming one pointed in the practice, the results come very quickly. If we harbor doubt in our minds, nothing will happen even after eons of practice. I, I, I personally, Jetsunma, have experienced this difference when I'm chanting my mantra. Some days I can be one-pointed and very sincere and feel like I'm really connecting with the deity. Other days my mind wanders. I'm just kind of going through the motions. So uh, some days I feel doubt. Other days I, I'm immersed. So if we do have these doubts about the benefits on some days of our focus waivers, how do you suggest we can continue to remove those doubts and become more one-pointed? Well, you know, we're human beings. So I think nobody ever just sits down and immediately the practice all comes together and everything, perfect concentration, perfect devotion, perfect everything. I mean, part of the path is dealing with all the uh, difficulties and obstacles which we encounter on the path. You know, it's not a smooth, clear, six-lane highway. And so, I mean, the point is to recognize that even if sometimes it's difficult, even if sometimes we're very distracted, even if sometimes we have doubts, the important thing is just to keep going and never give up. I mean, that's that's the main point, that some days it's going to be, and not to judge too much. Oh, that was a good, that was a good session. Oh, that was a terrible <laughs> session. And it was a session. You sat there, you did it. Even the mind was distracted, even you were fed up, even you had other things you'd rather be doing. Nonetheless, we sat and we did it. And that's enough. 
you know, not to, to judge ourselves, but just to keep going and, um, yeah, keep that continuity, like you're holding on to a rope. And sometimes it becomes very thin, but you're not letting it go. It's, it's still there pulling you along. One but, of the things the, I, you know, the, the, the commentaries are the ones that say that if we practice with, with you know, really uh, heartfelt, from the heart, then the um, results are very quick. And if we are, we are very sloppy and careless and always just very distracted and just go through the road uh, without really engaging then uh, it will take a long time. So they are encouraging us as much as possible when we can to, um, we know the difference, uh, you know, you're saying it yourself, you know, when we're really focused and practice and, and really in it, there's that inner joy that comes from that. And uh, that is uh, what keeps us going and keeps us encouraged, even if other times we feel like a you know rubber ball kind of deflated never mind we'll puff up again <laughs> i i've heard you say a few talk a few times in different talks and interviews about the importance of cultivating humor and i i, I listened to your uh interview on 10 percent happier with dan harris where you joked that you always say a sense of humor should be the seventh paramita um mm. How do we, how important is that? Is it, are, you're very, you're being very sincere when you say that, that humor is a really important quality to cultivate. Well, I think because a lot of people who get onto a spiritual path, especially in the West, take themselves terribly seriously, you know, and it becomes very heavy. And even when people, sometimes they go to, uh, you know, they go to a Dharma center, they're quite, you know, put off by the fact that everybody is very grimly practicing and there's no lightness. And I, when we look at, you know, in, in Asia, like we were into the Sakyadita this time in Korea, as I say, and um, mostly or 95% were Asian Buddhists from the various Buddhist countries and including about 1,000 Korean nuns. And everybody had such a good time. There was just so much laughter. There was so much joy. Nobody was grim. And, you know, if I'm spiritual, I have to be very serious and take everything very serious. Everybody was, you know, when they needed to be disciplined and present, they were disciplined. I mean, Korean nuns are very well trained and they could be very serious and disciplined. But the rest of the time, there was so much joy, so much fun. Everybody was really, you know, um, enjoying themselves and appreciating each other. And it wasn't in any way um, tight and intense and serious. Uh, maybe it's because when people go to church, they're supposed to be serious. And they don't have the idea that you can, you know, enjoy it and, and be joyful. I mean, at least in the Church of England. So, um, you know, I think it's very important not to take our, our ego too seriously, to see the games it plays and just smile at it. And then it loses its power. You know, if we can look at something with a friendly laughter, not a, a mocking laughter, you know, a, a friendly laughter, but don't take things too, don't make things heavy, lighten up, yeah. There's some nice questions coming in from our live audience. Is it okay if we move to some of those? There's, there's a, the first question um, and it's, people's uh, YouTube names aren't their real names. So this question, uh, well, sometimes there, but in this case, I don't think so. This question is from Gaming SFX, who says, do you believe in God? How do you think the universe was made? Um, well, I don't believe in the idea of a creator God who is something 
separate from creation and made everything and then is behind the scenes pulling all the strings and then at the end judges us on our on our performance i have never believed that ever it's one of the reasons why i came to buddhism because buddhism is non-theistic um, Buddhism believes that the universe is created by the karma of the beings inhabiting the universe. And what is more, it, the universe is beginningless and endless. It's endless cycles. And, and the universe is vast beyond any thought, as we all know. They always knew that. And um, no, I, I, I think that the universe is intelligent and is basically self-creating. Thank you, and thanks for the question. There's a question here from uh, Ladan or Leiden, uh, who says, how to practice effectively when you're getting older? Thank you, dear Jetsunma. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's very important because as we get older, death gets nearer. And um, you can't avoid anymore the fact that the one thing certain in life is death. So instead of worrying about that, the important thing is to recognize, okay, now is our opportunity. I'm not dead yet. And, um, you know, to, to really put the, your practice at the center of your life instead of at the periphery when we have a bit of time here or there, to recognize that our daily life is our practice and that we'd better get our mind into some kind of good shape now, because at the time of death, it's going to be too late. And so, you know, I, I think one good thing about being older is that you recognize all oh, most of the things you wanted to do, you've already done, or if you haven't, it didn't matter. And now we can put our, our attention to things which really do matter and which we're going to carry with us lifetime after lifetime so you know family's gone and you have probably retired and now give attention to what really at the time of death we can die with no regrets knowing that we made use of our human potential and now is the time not don't put it off any longer Otherwise, it's too late, you know, and then you'll say, oh, why didn't I do something? You know, it's too late now. So it's never too late if we start right now. That perfectly leads into our next question from Hoda that says, so what survives death? Consciousness? Yes. The body dies. The body is considered like a guest house, like a hotel room, which we've rented for a time, but we don't own it. And at a certain point, we have to leave the hotel room and go to another hotel room. And what goes is the, the consciousness, especially also the very subtle consciousness, which is, you know, deathless. So be ready, that's the point, you know, and as much as possible be, you know, at the time of death to really focus on our object of devotion, if we have one, um, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter as long as it opens up the heart to something beyond itself, you know, whether it's, you know, the Buddha or Tara or Krishna or Jesus, or it's, it's not important. If we don't have an object of devotion, then to just think of the light and go towards the light and not be afraid of the light so that we can, the consciousness then will, will go on and go up. It won't go down. And not to be afraid. Death is the most normal thing in the world. I mean, you know, we, we are born and we grow up and then we age and then we die. I mean, it's every, it happens to everybody and all animals too. I mean, it's the most normal thing in the world. Nothing to be afraid of. If 
we can prepare our mind in, in good time and use our human life purposefully to benefit ourselves, benefit others. Let go of this world and go forward. With, I mean, my feeling is it's a great adventure. You know, everybody has their idea what's going to happen next. Now we're going to find out. That's exciting. You know, we're going to find out what happens next. Who was right? Good. <laughs> That's exciting. It really is. Yeah. Finally, we'll know. There's a there's a, a nice follow up question here for clarification, I think, for people that might not understand from Eunice, who says, visualize a deity, but don't believe in them, question mark. No, I mean, the, the important thing with the deity is to recognize this is our true nature. That, for example, we are Tara. Tara isn't something which has just been fabricated. It's, uh, it's the, the reflection of our, our true being because she represents fearless compassion. She represents wisdom. She represents all the qualities which are our own innate qualities, which we don't recognize because we're so identified with our egoistic personality we don't realize our true nature. Tara, for example, or Chinrezig, any, any deities represent our true nature. And so the important thing is to recognize this is who we really are, if only we knew. And it's not just that I'm Tara and you're just an ordinary sentient being. I mean, all beings are Tara, all beings are Vodakiteshvara, all beings are Vajrayogini, whoever, it doesn't matter, all beings have that innate divine quality which we don't recognize in ourselves or in others and so in vajrayana is to help us to gain what is called pure perception to see things and beings as they really are and not the way we project them with our, our distorted perception so yes the deity is much more real than me, Tenzin Palmo. Tenzin Palmo is a fabrication. Tara is genuine. Eunice says, ah, thanks. Another question related to death and dying from Reina, who says, what can a Buddhist practitioner do for atheistic friends who are dying? I think that the important thing is to tell them to let go of all their attachments at this time. This is a time for transition. And so not to grasp at um, relationships to, first of all, before they go, to make sure that everything is on, um, on an official level okay, so they don't leave chaos behind them. For example, that they've made a good will, which is fair and won't create lots of problems when they go, and that they say sorry to anyone they have harmed or hurt. If they can't meet them, then say sorry in their in their heart and, and let go of any resentment. And if possible, to tell those that they care for and they love, thank you very much and I really love you too, but now I've got to go. And then if possible, just let them relax. And if they could, as I say, think of the light. I mean, it doesn't hurt you, whether whatever you believe in or don't believe in, to think about light and going towards light and just just let go because uh, people hold on and they cling and it creates a lot of problems actually next time and also for the people that they're leaving behind so say goodbye to everybody 
and just release and let go. You don't have to have any particular beliefs in order to do that. I mean, that's just really common sense, except it's not common. And be in peace. Whatever's going to happen next is going to happen. So find out. I think we have time for, for one more question. Um, this one is from Jerome, who says, what is the purpose in Vajrayana of cultivating magic? There's not much use in cultivating magic, actually. Um, the tantras, as they were in India, are basically magical texts. Um, both white magic and black magic, to be honest. Um, when it got to Tibet, then on the whole, they realized that it was there was a danger in cultivating power, which is what the tantras are about. And especially by the time you got to people like Atisha and others, they recognized that we had to cultivate underneath a very strong foundation in compassion and ethics and in good heart. And they emphasize very much that um, all our practice is essentially in order to benefit others, not just for benefiting ourselves. So, I mean, um, Atisha himself says that the highest city city is like magical powers, not flying or, or, you know, doing all the things which are clairvoyance and so forth. He said the highest city is to have, cultivate a good heart. And so that's the point. You know, he recognized very much that what we really needed was not more clairvoyance. The Buddha himself, you, in the Vinaya, one is not allowed to uh, talk about any magical uh, accomplishments. It's against the Vinaya. Um, because you can have many, many magical accomplishments, but be totally unenlightened. Or you can be a, a complete Buddha and still have no magical accomplishments at all. So, um, essentially, it's irrelevant. Usually, many great masters do have like clairvoyance and other cities, but usually they never show them. They, you would only find out about it quite by chance. Um, I have never known any genuine master who has um, spoken about or in any way claimed to have any specific psychic powers. They wouldn't. In fact, they would be more likely to deny it. So the important thing with the Vajrayana is that it's considered to be a swift way to really understand the true nature of the mind. The true nature of the mind is the most magical thing in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been uh, having the privilege of speaking with Jetsun Matenz in Palmo uh, on many things, but particularly we've been focusing on reflections on a mountain lake, teachings on practical Buddhism, which uh, was re-released earlier this year. And uh, I want to thank our live audience for being here and, and, and sharing this special time and for all of your wonderful questions. And uh, a thank you to Philippe for, for being there to support Jetsunma. And it's wonderful to see you again. And Jetsunma, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Huge gratitude from myself and Jacob and, and the whole Banyan Books community. Thank you, Ross. Thank you. Lovely to be with you. And thank you for your very intelligent questions. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound. Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. 
Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com. <laughs>